We'll call the meeting to order. We'll, uh, and welcome to you all. The roll call is accomplished. Everyone is here. Uh, and we, we're going to take a few items out of order, uh, including the uh, presentation by the Community College League on redistricting as soon as Paul gets here. So we'll, we'll do that when, when, it, when he arrives. Uh, we have, uh, we have a, uh, a presentation by Human Resources uh, in terms of classified longevity. Would you, Sue, would you like to do that? Good afternoon, members of the board. Dr. Friedlander, this is an ideal time. At this time, I would like to invite Eileen Amix, financial aid technician, to come forward and be recognized for 10 years of service. And speaking uh, for her is Brad Hardison, director of financial aid. Uh, good afternoon, members of the board. Um, Brad Hardison, financial aid director. It's my honor to um, be here with Eileen. And she actually started in the financial aid office, I believe, in May uh, of that year. She's been recognized for 10 years, but she actually started as an hourly employee. She, um, she'll probably talk about this in some of her remarks, but she was known to City College. And uh, uh, Marsha Wright, the OPS director, says, I, have, I know this person, she's looking for some work. Do you have any work in financial aid? And I said, yeah, we have an hourly position. We're needing to reconcile some spreadsheets and do some balancing. So Eileen took that job on. Um, it's probably not her most uh, uh, desired type of work, but she actually did a pretty good job with it. And she did that for a couple of months. And then at that time, our uh, financial aid um, technician at the front left, our work study coordinator, and I asked Eileen if she'd be willing to apply for the job. We had her in there for an interim, and she did. And I would say that the job she does as the front desk, um, as a work study coordinator and work at the front desk is probably one of the hardest jobs in the financial aid office because she talks to every student, every parent that comes by our office and repeats the same information time and time again to students and parents over the telephone or in person. But she always does it very happy, upbeat, like it's the first time she's talked to somebody. And that's a very difficult job to do. I've worked up there. and. Sometimes I'm just saying, I don't know if I can say the same thing again, 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 <laughs> and keep the same attitude, but Eileen always does. So she's a wonderful asset to the office. She's very funny. She brings a lot of uh, joy to the office, and she's a wonderful employee, and um, I think it's great that she's been there 10 years, and the college has really uh, benefited by having her work in our office and um, contribute to financial aid. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to Eileen to say a few words. brief and uh, thank Brad for hiring me. It's been a honor and a pleasure to be able to work here and be a part of such a great uh, junior college. And uh, without Brad, I, our financial aid department would not be where it is today and we are probably one of the best in the nation. And I would like to say that I have been here for 52 years because my father is a retired uh, Dick Wiest, um, came here. Uh, 52 years ago, and I remember skating here <laughs> in this building. So I have a lot of great memories, great times, and um, hope to be here a few more years. So thank you very much. Thank you, Eileen. Someday I want you to tell me how you were skating. Were you skating in this room? Oh, skating, right here on the tile. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Vanessa Patterson is here from the Foundation for Santa Barbara City College to give us what I hope to be a, a kind of routine report on the workings of the Foundation. Thank you so much. Okay. Expand and grow our community of support. 
Good afternoon. I'm Vanessa Patterson, the Executive Director of the Foundation for Santa Barbara City College. And I want to thank you very much for inviting me to be here today. And I also want to thank each and every one of you for sharing your personal interest in supporting the foundation and the efforts. So thank you. I led with expand and grow our community of support because that is really our theme. If there's one thing that stands out today, it's those words, expand and grow our community of support. <laughs> but I'd like to give a brief overview of the foundation and what we're doing uh, to support the college and our students and then answer questions that most everyone has asked repeatedly throughout this year, how can I help? The foundation is the means by which the, our community can support our college and our students. Basically, it's clear when you hear it from a student perspective, and Anna Aguilar, our first year student here at Santa Barbara City College, said it best. I said, Anna, how, has a student, how have you been impacted by the foundation? and she works in our office, so it's very easy to get the answer. She said, well, I study at the library on the weekends because I work full time during the week, and I also go to school full time. And the foundation funds the library being open all weekend. I research on the internet using the cyber, cyber center because I don't have a personal computer and I don't have internet access at home. The foundation funds the cyber center. My books were purchased by the foundation, averaging $180 per textbook this year, over $300 worth of support for just two classes. My books were purchased by an emergency book grant offered by the foundation. The Running Start program found me and my parents when I was in high school and invited me to participate. And that's how I found Santa Barbara City College. And the Running Start program is funded via the foundation. And I'm also a student in your Express to Success program because I want to be a doctor someday. I want to transfer to UCLA, but I wasn't college ready. And so I'm a part of your Express to Success program, which has helped uh, supported financially via the foundation. And these are just five ways that one student has been impacted here. And we have the priv privilege of supporting thousands of students in that way here every year. And it's a collaborative effort how those processes happen. Uh, we do that in conjunction with Dr. Uh, Friedlander and also our board of trustees um, and the college uh, deans and their faculty. So it's really a pleasure to represent such a great institution. From fundraising, we closed our fiscal year 2010-2011, raising just under $4 million. And that was $500,000 above our goal. Um, the campaign for student success was held in the last six weeks, and you participated, and I want to th say thank you for that, too. Thank you for coming to our training sessions, leading call nights. Um, really, your presence there was very appreciated. And during that last six weeks, we grew our donor base by 38%. And that's huge. Over all this time, 38% in a very short period of time, and I want to say thank you. I have a question, um, and you don't have to answer, but the question is, what is the biggest difference between UCSB and Santa Barbara City College in our fundraising efforts? I know the answer. Okay, <laughs> Jack. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, of course, the dollar amount uh, via the foundation is probably what joins, jumps out at us. But what's interesting to know is our donors actually give more per donor by $1,000 via the average donor of UCSB. The only difference, the only difference is the size. Last year we had 1,438 donors support the foundation. UCSB had 17,500. Taking it at a national look, the average donor gives the exact same amount to a two-year institution as they do to a four-year institution. Volume is really the answer to our fundraising efforts. Expand and grow our community of support. George Thurlow from UCSB said to me that his most important resources, um, because they're uniquely qualified to help him in his efforts to grow the foundation, is the college trustees. And I am so grateful for your enthusiasm and your support because I need you, we need you, we need your help. 
I'd love for you to all be spokespersons and ambassadors for our foundation. Um, I invite you to our guest who's coming to lunches. We host them every Friday at noon in the gourmet dining room. Marty came to one. It was a wonderful opportunity for you to interact and engage with faculty and our donors and our board members. Also, thank you for attending our events, the President's Council Garden Party. It's incredibly powerful. People notice that you're there. They know, they know, they look and they say, wow, it's great, you know, and oh, I saw, you know, so-and-so, it's wonderful. And please, we invite you to join our committees. We have 11 committees. Our newest committee is our alumni committee, but please participate, we'd love to have you. Um, and our campaign for student success. This is an annual initiative that we're going to be doing each and every year. This year, it's running March 15th through April 30th. I invite you to be the champions of our cause. Please help us. Let's get, let's get talking now. We'd love to talk to you more about that. And again, last year, your support was so powerful. Expand and grow our community of support. We had 1,438 donors last year. My goal is 5,000 in the next 18 months. And all my training says you're never supposed to say that publicly, but I feel so strongly about it I have to share it with you. Please help me. I need your help. I have my business cards because as you're out in public and you run into people, please pass it on. Also, I'd love to you know, join you. My board president would love to join you. My team would love to join you. Anyone that you need from the foundation is there to help facilitate relationships that you have. Um, please, thank you. Thank you for this. I look forward to um, hopefully future opportunities to meet with you and share with what's going on. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Any question? Yeah, where, where do you get your enthusiasm? <laughs> well, you I, know, I, whatever, you're, whatever you're drinking, I, <laughs> I, I want some of that. Well, <laughs> thank you, but I went to school here. No, no, Vanessa, she yes. said um, for a donation, you'll give it to them. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's right, that's right. But I was a former student here, and I just owe so much to Santa Barbara City College, so anything that I can do to help us grow and help more students and help the college, I'd love to help. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and uh, just to give you an update, you know, Vanessa and I, well, we each agreed that through the college planning you know, council and processes, that we're going to update the college priorities for the foundation, and also making a concerted effort to have more of the faculty, staff, and students you know, be ambassadors as well and managers to um, identify you know, people they know to help contribute to the foundation to help our students, especially now more than ever. It's um, that extra support that she talked about, that one student receiving. Our students are really strapped you know, more and more for um, just to live on and stay in school. And with fees going up again, $10 this summer, it seems like it's only $10 per unit more, but it was $10 on top of $10. And just some of the students who I have visited with, um, they're, they don't know if they can take as many classes anymore going forward. It's just um, you know, a day-by-day -day situation with far too many. And so what the foundation is doing their efforts, the more we can support what Vanessa's goal is to get the 5,000 increase, uh, that would be, our students would benefit tremendously from that. Also, uh, Dr. Hasland, um, you know, Paul Mitchell's here now, if you want to. Good. But, but before we go on, w the rumor is that it's really okay for members of the board to become part of the President's Council. Is, is that true? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, the President's Council supports the foundation in its operations and that. Actually, I think membership is open pretty generally, isn't it? Anybody here can join the President's Council. Yeah, that's very true. Oh, good. I'm glad to clarify that. Paul Mitchell, would you uh, join us? Paul is going to talk about our uh, redistricting process. Respond to questions. Thank you very much for having me here today. I 
sent an email to Jack just a few minutes ago because we were at Kinko's for about half an hour trying to get printouts. Mm -hmm. uh, it didn't work out, so we have the overheads, and I trust that many of the trustees still have the printouts from the last time. They're exactly the same. We didn't make uh, any changes, although we did, I think, through some emails that I think you received, provide some clarifications, and I'm happy mm -hmm. to talk about those in more detail. And what I was going to bring up on the slide, the, the original presentation I have, I also have the big blow-ups of each of the individual districts and a big blow-up of the overview just so that everybody who's in the audience can see and uh, the same materials that you have printed copies of. So, Paul, if I recall correctly from our last conversation, you're going to tweak some of the districts or areas such that... Um, the one on the far right. That the original the original patterns would be changed just a little. Yeah, I think the, um, our discussion was looking at option one, and the concern was um, about having enough longer term residents in the Isla Vista you know, district and area. What we found, um, and some of this was reflected in the conversation that we had, was that option one actually achieved some of what was the main point of that question. In option one, Isla Vista is uh, divided, and in that division, there's 980 voters under the age of 24 in Isla Vista on one side, 962 voters that are under 24 in Isla Vista on the other side, and then in, um, so I think even in the under 35 population, it's 1,500 on one side, 1,600 on the other. So really that division is about as good as you're gonna get with regard to that key point, which is a, is a significant point, and that is how many permanent older residents that would be willing to serve four years on a community college board are going to be able to come from that area. And the only way to further address that would be to introduce a third district, but that's probably not gonna be feasible. So each of the districts you've be depicted here has approximately 29,000 people? Yeah, between 27 and 29. 27 and change, 29 and change. In fact, the actual number's right there. And we didn't even rehearse this. No, we didn't. Okay. Um, I, I have a question before we go forward, because huh? option three, did option three put all of Isla Vista into a single district? There was an option that put all of Isla Vista into a single district. That probably, I think that was option three, and I could three. go to it if and we need so to. so that was obviously appropriately allocated? Yeah, this, is a, this really is, is something for the board to decide. The board could decide on, the, you know, that it's important to keep Isla Vista together. The court board could decide this other criteria that it's important to keep a, an equal number as much as possible of, of more permanent residents in each district. So that's really a decision for the board. It's not, I'm here to inform that process, but not to help you really make that decision. I guess, I guess my assumption is since you created this option three that it met the criteria that you feel each of the need plans, to Each of the met. plans except for the four district plan that was presented okay. is, each okay. of the so seven district plans. Option three is viable. Yeah, uh, I believe so. Uh, on the note that you sent to us, you said that two thirds of the population under option three uh, is under 24 years of age. 67% I believe was under, uh, under 24 years old. Or 67 percent was under 35 years old. 81 percent was under. 81 percent was under 35 year old. 67 was under 24 year old. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, um, Marsha, and then Maury is next. Um, the first step, as I understand it, in what we've been doing, is to balance population. Yes. And then we looked at polarized voting issues. Um, yeah. Be, okay. Okay. Am I? Yeah, the, basic, just to be, to because be of the results, it. because of the results of the racially polarized voting study, we made the suggestion that it'd be best to go to seven districts. And then once we decide seven districts, then we have our now goal population of around 28,000 people. But yeah, population becomes the key criteria. Okay, but um, when you originally presented it to us, you were talking in terms of population first. Mm -hmm. And there was a population for single member, which is the one we have up there for double for two members and for three members. Mm -hmm. And then we went to the racially polarized voting question to analyze that. And one of the questions that you got that we got an email on, I think, was um, 
the statewide races were analyzed, but not the local races. And we have quite a number of um, what I would consider high-profile local races. I think Santa Barbara has a real interest in its local races, and, and um, I, for one, think it would inform our discussions to have the data on uh, at least a significant number of those local races, including, of course, um, ones pertaining to us. Yeah, so um, when I got that question, the, the way that we've generally done these is we start with the large races that are generally what's used in a, in a California Voting Rights Act case. In each of the California Voting Rights Act cases, interestingly, they use Prop 187, Prop 209, Prop 227, which was you know a decade ago or more. So uh, we use those in our first look. If in cases we don't find any racially polarized voting in those r races, we will sometimes dig deeper. Um, there are a couple community colleges, three in particular, where we didn't find much at the statewide race, so we had to look at the local level. Local races uh, show more racially polarized voting. That's what the research shows repeatedly, because in local races where there's maybe less information, they know less about their you know, local judge or a local city council member than they do about President Obama. Um, in those local races, surname becomes a, a, a stronger factor. Uh, looking at the precinct by precinct uh, analysis of one race in particular, I was able to find a Latina candidate who got extremely strong support out of the three most heavily Latino districts in Santa Barbara and very, very small support out of the more, out uh, of the less Latino precincts. And it was a wide variance. Um, in the three precincts that uh, were heavily Latina, she was getting 45 to 50 percent of the vote in a multi-way race. In the other districts, she was getting 19 percent. She was going from being first place in the Latino precincts to third place and out of contention in the, uh, in the wider precincts. So while we can do that, usually we do that when that top layer of statewide races doesn't net a useful result. And if we do that, my absolute expectation is that it's going to be very stronger, stronger for those local races because of our look at the precinct level data already. Well, Paul, if I may, the... Um, but we could do scatter plots and stuff well, just for more work. So when I called to your attention, you responded to it. I said, well, we had one of the board members said, uh, with respect to our local school board election, you had you know, two Latinos you know, elected on the board. And I think in your response to me, which I forwarded to the board today, or yesterday, you addressed that. You said, here's the analysis of that. But you want to review that? Yeah, the, there is a, um, a misconception with regard to the California Voting Rights Act specifically that, that having representation from an African-American community, a Latino or an Asian community is, is itself the proof that there isn't racially polarized voting and no potential for a California Voting Rights Act claim. That's not what and I'm getting at. I'm not saying that's what you were saying, but that's something that comes up quite a bit. Um, but, you know, as an example, like you've cited, there are Latinos, Latinas that have been elected in different parts of the district. Um, we could analyze it, but I don't think it would change the overarching point that this district uh, would fall under really some scrutiny under the California Voting Rights Act because of the overarching polarization. I'm really not interested so much in, I, I accept that you might well get the same result, but we're looking at drawing lines here. Mm -hmm. And my thought is twofold. One, that I do erroneously or not believe that Santa Barbara does pay some pretty close attention to its local races. <coughs> They're not just names. They are people that many people are pretty familiar with or have, you know, uh, paid attention to the local elections. And I'm also thinking that as we draw lines, what you learn in looking at those races could help us because um, the divisions that you're talking about are probably not the same in all census blocks. There are probably variations in the census blocks. So you may look at a um, predominantly white census block and find a relatively low or a relatively high proportion of votes for a Latino candidate. Mm -hmm. And that might inform drawing a line because um, 
as I understand it, we're not getting to a majority situation. I mean, the actual voting population here is even less than the numbers we're considering, correct? The, um, are you talking about the percentage, like in this slide right here, the percentage Latino? Um, which, can, which one are you looking at? Look at option two. Uh, that's way at the back of this. I, I'd have to go through the end of the slide. Option presentation. two, I believe you managed to get to 43%. For one Latino seat. Yeah, I do recall that. That was very tightly packed around the most Latino portions Correct. of Santa Barbara. And it was my assumption that was the best that you could do. That was the best we could create. But if I'm thinking if you had a finer grained analysis of local elections, you might well see that you could do better. Well, <laughs> I the, don't know. The numeric number of 43% Latino, as I remember in drawing that, it was not, higher to, it was not possible to get higher than that 43% Latino, no matter where you moved those lines. Um, and one of the interesting things about uh, analyzing local elections is that local elections use consolidated precincts which are huge relative to our ability to do census blocks. So we navigate, when we draw these lines, they're a lot finer grain than the big chunky cent, uh, precincts that you look at in, um, in the local election results. So um, especially with off-cycle elections, when an election's held in 2007, 9, or 11, those elections in particular use big consolidated precincts <coughs> because they have less polling places. How are you correlating the precinct then with the census block in terms of vote? It's very technical, but uh, what actually happens is that with statewide races, we're able to not only get the election results for the individual precincts, not the consolidated, but the individual polling place precincts, but also we're able to look at the voter file after the election and determine which actual people voted. And then we disaggregate that population from the census block, from the precinct down to the census block level based on a weighting of the people that actually voted either absentee as one data set or uh, poll voting as a second data set. So we're actually with a, a, able to directly correlate about 80% of the actual votes and then 20% of them are distributed evenly among that precinct. So there is uh, a much stronger correlation back to the census block for that data than you would ever find in just doing precinct analysis. It's very technical, sorry. Um, and of the 43% that you got with option two, what number would it be if you applied actual voting percent? In other words, the percent of people not who are eligible to vote, but the people who actually vote. That would require switching to a different metric. Um, and I could provide that. That would be interesting potentially, because what I would do is I would look at surname-based voter registrations. Mm -hmm. And that would allow me to determine that area is maybe 37 or 50 or whatever percent Latino surnamed voters. Uh, we can do Latino surnamed voters and Asian surname, surnamed voters. We can't do African American surnamed voters because Paul Mitchell in one community is African American and other communities white. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm inclined to think that, I, that would I, I be, think that'd be very. I think that could be something that would be very helpful and we can provide that maybe even by um, I might even be able to provide something like that to you before the end of the meeting. Okay. Well, Jack, correct me if yeah. I'm wrong. We're going to have a study session as yeah. well to Paul, discuss this. Yeah, um, Paul, that's right. Just to your here. Um, a week from today, the board will be discussing uh, the options. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, whatever you send to me, I'll forward it to the board. But that way they can have it in advance of next Thursday's study session. And in thinking about this a little further, what I actually can provide is going to be maybe too detailed. But what I can provide is voter registration by ethnicity by district. I can also provide voter turnout by ethnicity by district for each of the last even-yeared elections for the last decade. It's because I have ethnic turnout for each of the even years. I don't have ethnic turnout for the odd-year elections. Mm -hmm. But I can provide that. It would be a lot. But it would be a nice little spreadsheet to, to look through. Yeah. I mean, what I'm looking for here is the best data to allow us to draw the best lines that maximize um, Latino influence or the majority minority. If, if you can get to majority, it sounds like you think you can't. But I'm looking for the data that lets us draw the best line that we can get the most, uh, the furthest down the road to what it, I understand the law to be asking us to do. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I understand that. And Maury, you were next, I think. 
Well, I just wanted to point out in splitting Isla Vista, the idea is there's only about nine or 10,000 so-called permanent or adult it's eligible uh, to become a trustee. And I just wanted to point out that that's as much population as Carpinteria has or Montecito has. And we've been electing trustees from those two areas with that population. So going along with the idea of compactness, I, I, I would, my personal view would like to keep Isla Vista together. And I think with 10,000 uh, so-called eligible people to become trustees, that's more than enough. And that's part of the board decision. Yeah. I, I want to provide the information for every viewpoint just to make sure everybody's armed with the information. Okay, and uh, Luis is next, and Joan is after. I wanted to go back to the point that Marcia was making, and that if you, <coughs> I want to make sure that I under, understood it, you mm -hmm. know, that if you drill down to that, won't, be that, won't that be skewed uh, simply because of the at-large elections that you'll be looking at, all those elections that have taken that? I mean, because typically when you have district elections, there's more of a tendency of people to go out and vote potentially because they're voting for individuals that represent their area, live in their area, and they'll be encouraged to vote, whereas the way we have been, people say, eh, it's a done deal. Yeah. You know? I think so. So I'm wondering if that wouldn't be reflected yeah, right. in those numbers. Say you have X number registered voters and only X voted. Well, the question is why? And yeah. that's what we're trying to get at by looking at district elections versus at large, right? Yeah, if, I, if I may just add, um, most of the elections that take place in Santa Barbara, which I shared with you earlier on, were um, district-wide elections as opposed to you know, individual district. But I'm not sure if that would influence your analysis or not. I mean, it's an interesting observation, but I don't know. I'll provide the data raw, and you'll know locally what races were really engaging, maybe which ones weren't. Uh, clearly, the 2008 general election is going to be off the charts. And, uh, but other than that, you're going to see little variations. 2004 and 6 were relatively low turnout. Um, so you'll see, and what you'll see that's going to be most interesting is when turnout rises, if Latino percentage of the vote rises, or if turnout drops, if Latino percentage of the vote rises or drops, depending on, it, it's different in different parts of the state. Right. Yeah. Uh, Joan was next, and then Marsha. Yeah, it was a discussion that I had hoped we would have, but we didn't have, of looking at the district neutrally mm -hmm. as communities of interest. And we raised the issue, and to not have it identified by name, but even to look at it without any lines at all, where we would look at this particular district and think about neutral, what are our communities of interest? What kind of map would that look like to be the, the guiding principle rather than slicing and dicing it from the, the bottom up? But what would it look like with what we have a consensus about that are relative communities of interest and then work with the, the data and the, the profiling that you want to accomplish? So was there a way that we could take some sort of natural, instinctive communities of interest that exist already, of which Isla Vista is a community of interest. Mm -hmm. And it does, it is a legal district according to option three, but we didn't have that discussion. We never looked at the district as a whole. And I wonder now if it's too late to do this, but I'm a little concerned that we're down at the level of such fine tuning now, not having had that discussion and rejecting it maybe, but we never even had the discussion. So I'll throw it out again that what I was thinking of, these are communities of interest for Santa Barbara City College. This is our district. We have a north interest, we have a south interest, and that's simply because the distance from the college. We have a Mesa interest because the college is located up there. We have a Goleta interest because it's an intact community. We have three high schools that are our feeder high schools. Those tend to be communities of interest. They have parents, they have students. So if we looked at these various communities of interest that already exist in our district and we gave them some sort of radius and then, then worked with, well, how can we make these appropriately legal jurisdictions? Well, uh, one of the things that's interesting is that in first drawing these lines, we didn't have 
incumbents when we were at the staff level first drawing these lines. And there's some things that draw themselves in these plans. As an example, uh, the district on the southern end, or the it, based on South Facing Beach, but the, the <laughs> western end, um, that district basically draws itself because it's okay, a population. But I'm backing up to us as a board to oh, get yeah, a sorry. blank map well, first, okay. and then yeah. you can do your work on top of that if we agreed that there were these natural communities of interest, mm -hmm. and then you could draw it without reference to incumbents or whatever. But just draw them because this is the this is the district we are handing down to the voters, at least for ten years, and who knows maybe for thirty years, and I think it it just needs a little more thoughtful consideration about what makes a natural cluster for Santa Barbara City College, which you're presenting natural clusters by certain criteria to meet voting regulations, but are we? totally ignoring that these are natural clusters that might have some sort of influence on the district itself. That would be better to have this particular group of voters together because they share a common interest. And we just haven't had that discussion. So I'm, I'm sorry. And I don't know if it's too late to, if that would throw it way back to the drawing board again. Or maybe we can't reach any consensus. Maybe yeah. that's the, the stumbling blocks. But I have to throw it out there. I think that is the most neutral way to start this process. And um, I think, is there a particular, from your perspective, community of interest that's not accurately being represented? Well, I don't, I don't know the high school districts because we're struggling with Isla Vista, but we've got Dos Pueblos, we've got San Marcos, and we've got um, Santa Barbara High School. So do those Carpenteria. tend to create? Carpinteria high, high School. Schools. Well, no, Carpinteria is in the South County. But it's in our I, district. So Carpinteria is in and a and southern services. So does Bishop High School. Oh, okay. So does okay. High School. Who are our local theater high schools? Right. That's that's a good point. So is there a community of interest that lives around there where the students go to this particular high school that a trustee would have more relevance reaching out to a local population because they become our clients and they therefore there would be more of a direct interest in who their trustee was. Um, and as I say, I think North and South need some sort of recognition because they are the distance problems. They can't get to campus as easily, so they have interests that are unique. The Mesa, I know, is, is unique because we impact it so heavily with housing and parking and campus expansion, whatever, that that, that really is a community of interest. And then um, if we have entities, Carpinteria being a intact community of interest, Goleta being an intact community of interest. Um, I, wonder, I wonder if it would work. I mean, I, 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 I appreciate your, your idea. I think it's, it's a good one, and I don't, I don't see any reason why we couldn't discuss it at the, at the study session upcoming. Um, and it would be interesting, Paul, if you could supply um, sort of a sense of whether that's being taken account of in any of the existing models or whether it would generate a new model. Uh, I, you know, I think it's something that we should be discussing because Joan is right. We're going to be making a decision that will have a long reaching impact. And Marsha was next. Um, Martin, were you responding to Joan or go should ahead. I go back? I mean, yeah. uh, the question I was going to ask is. Um, <coughs> Can you, in studying your data, distinguish down ticket offense, um, effects versus... Um, Vote drop-off, you mean? Yes. I mean, the general effect that people fill out the top of the ticket first and then get tired and don't get to the bottom. Um, I can determine that on statewide ticket through legislative. I can determine it if I went down to um, local election in the even-numbered years. I could look at presidential versus um, like a local school board drop off. Um, generally, drop off begins at the legislative race. And, and does it affect the assessment of um, polarized voting or is it, it sort of does, neutral? It's actually neutral. Actually, who votes really doesn't affect much of the assessment of racially polarized voting in a way because it, the racially polarized voting um, can take the form of drop off. You know, it can take the form even of non-participation. It can take a lot of forms. So, um, and I can't show whether or not Latinos drop off more than 
than white voters or other groups. Um, it's not possible to disaggregate that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Marty, I think you were next. Yeah. Um, Joan, you brought up the uh, communities of interest last time at our study session, and I thought about that. I thought that was a good point. Looking at it, um, the problem from my point of view is that each of the high schools in the high school district uh, have a great number of transfers. I think if you and I looked at it and saw how many people, like from my my place, my uh, neighborhood on the uh, Mesa, go to Santa Barbara High School, go to San Marcos High School, go to um, Laguna Blanca too, and Providence Hall downtown, and go to those Pueblos, you'd find a huge number going to each of those. So we have a community of interest of high school students who go to public school, but that's true of the whole South Coast. It's kind of a, it's, that would be a difficult thing to try to put circles around all the people that go to Dos Pueblos and where they live. You wouldn't have. I'm thinking of their that, parents, their I understand, residences. Well, parents where they live usually is where the student lives. So then you've got, um, you don't have that contingent. We have to have uh, borders that look, they don't look like they're gerrymandered around one house or a couple houses or something like that. So from my point of view, I'm looking at A and G, I guess those are the two, well, not really. Um, I'm looking at the furthest north and the furthest south. No, it's the furthest east and furthest west. It always gets to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and those are the two that, that, you know, those, the borders of those are going to kind of be set in some ways, although I know on that one C could be up and down more instead of flat out. So <laughs> if I'm making any sense, I'm looking at uh, option one and option two. And, and here's my question. That's option one up there, right? Mm -hmm. Would it be possible, talking about communities of interest, Isla Vista is one that maybe shouldn't be split up. I'm kind of thinking along the same lines as Maury. Uh, and if not, then, if it's not split up, then can we take A, B, and C from option two? It's like, it's like a Chinese menu here. Mm -hmm. Take A, B, and C from option two, and then uh, maybe a little bit different D, E, F, and G. Uh, but you would have the Latino area in the downtown of Santa Barbara uh, from the other option. Wait, I'm mixing myself up here. I see what you're saying. So it's the other, option two it's the is idea the one is, that is has to keep a Isla Vista. Latino yeah, I know. It's to keep Isla Vista Latino. whole, like Maury said, and and pull, <laughs> and on the other ones have a Latino voting. So is that option two? I think option three is the one that keeps it together. And the more I look at option three with communities of interest, the more you know, option three spreads out the Latinos the most, I yeah, think. Yeah, it does. And that's not what we're trying to do. Look at the numbers. Well, it's E and, and Isla Vista is another concentration of Latino voters. I mean, isn't that what we were discussing, the downtown area? Isla Vista, and then there's a concentration of Carpinteria. That, that if we covered downtown and we covered Isla Vista, we would be picking the two most concentrated areas. Was that? That's what I was trying to say. Thank you. <laughs> I think that, um, first off, the question of whether or not you want to, these can be dealt with independently. If you said, I want, we want to have the downtown district drawn like it is in one plan. We want Isla Vista drawn like it is in another plan. It's likely that since those are rather far apart, we could make the rest of the district work. Generally, when you make Isla Vista whole, you have a better opportunity to make Goleta whole. Okay. That becomes the immediate after effect of, of that decision. Okay. The, um, you're not going to, under any of those scenarios, really affect the southernmost district, because that southernmost district basically draws itself. Right. Um, you would significantly change the districts within Santa Barbara the more you concentrate the, around the downtown core population, right. the more you affect in, in a, you could think of that as like a little ecosystem. And that little ecosystem will, will shift and adjust based on how you draw that. And you can think of the Isla Vista Goleta area as a second ecosystem. Yeah. Can you look at option two here? I'll, you guys can, I'll just keep clicking. Okay. Sorry. This is like memory lane. Any other questions? 
That does show, by the way, the, the Latino, portion. Latino portion and then the heavily voting Latino interest portion. Well, can you go back to the 13th slide you just showed? option one. That That's the, the one we're talking about that splits out of Vista. Mm -hmm. option, two. option two is a more uh, densely populated downtown core. It maintains Isla Vista Hole and it maintains Goleta Hole. And you see how when you maintain the Goleta Hole, then Isla Vista has to come across into the second half of Santa Barbara. Remember, there's a little funky part of Santa Barbara in the middle of what C there. Mm -hmm. So. Sorry, I don't know what the I don't know what the neighborhood's like, but from a demogra from a mapping perspective, it kind of just pops up out of nowhere. Is that, the, is that called the the blank spot on that previous one that we were looking at? It's that unincorporated area, but yeah, yeah Santa Barbara, where, where the letter C is right now on the previous slide, you had it kind of blank. Yeah, there's Santa Barbara basically has a it has a non-contiguous part. Right. Santa Barbara, and then you go a, mi a few miles, and then there's another part of Santa Barbara again. Right. Correct, yeah. but. Everybody votes. In the Santa Barbara election, yeah, sure. Oh, yeah, and in, yeah. In, in our election. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. They have been voting because it's been at large. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So making Goleta Hole and Isla Vista Hole creates that horizontal relationship. Making D Hole creates a very different uh, set of lines for the districts around. Uh, D in this scenario, I would guess, although the data is probably back here, creates the largest in influence Latino seat. That's the 43 percent, which is definitely so, much larger than option two. Now, what's interesting is option, option if you look one. at, I'm sorry, if we look at the kind of the midpoint between C and E, that line, that horizontal line, that's kind of, it's almost like it's the waste of the district. That line is not very dissimilar from the line in, in uh, option one that waste is pretty much the same. So you could theoretically say we want the A, B, and C of one plan and the remainder of the other plan. Yeah. Like I said, they kind of exist as two separate ecosystems. C and G are unchanged in both, essentially. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Are there other questions of Paul? Are you coming to our study session? I don't think so, but I think I'm double booked, triple booked. This, community colleges need to start having morning meetings and meetings on Saturdays so that I can make all these. I have 19 community college districts I'm working with, wow. and I'm often triple booked. Wow. Is there um, a phone call possibility? Yes. Because I think that would be very helpful, Paul. Because um, they'll meet a week from today at 4 o'clock in the board for study session. But is there any time between like 4 and you know, 5, 5.30? That would work for you. That uh, we can call you. You can call it into us. Because I that, can make that work. Okay. So um, why don't we plan? I, I'll just set it now. A little after about four. You know, about ten after four. We'd um, you give us a call. I, I, we call you. Okay. okay. And um, if that works for your calendar, uh, wherever you are. Okay. I mean, last time you were driving, you pulled off the side of the freeway, and you, and you were able to. It worked. It worked. <laughs> um, to address Marsha's question from the Latino percentage voting of those districts, we ran the numbers. And um, unfortunately, Latino turnout is rather low in that area. So the, the percentage we've created in terms of its total vote in that district was 30. Mm -hmm. In terms of turnout, it fluctuates anywhere between 25 to 21 percent of turnout. Um, given a, a couple different, that's for the 2010 and 2008 elections and primaries. Um, we can look at the other option that's more densely concentrated that gets 43% Latino, but you'd expect at least a five point drop off in terms of actual voter participation, percent of the vote. Okay, just to be clear then, um, you ran the numbers on a 30% um, voter eligible, correct? You yeah, we ran the, on option on one. voter option on voter one. eligible, and of the voter eligible, what percent voted? It was ranging between twenty-one and twenty-five percent. 
So of the 30%, you're only getting? We're losing 5 to 8 percent, five to nine percent. Oh, that. okay. Now that I've, makes more sense because I, you know, if you say 25 percent of 30 percent, that's a much smaller number than 25 oh, percent instead yeah. of 30 percent. That's a much better number. <laughs> um, it looks like we have option two as well. And in option two, the most Latino district that was at 43 percent, uh, it drops down to 35 is the high and 30 is the low in terms of Latino voter participation. Paul, I, I'm a little uncomfortable with just numbers flying by. Oh, sure, yeah, let's, of course. Let's, let's put them on paper so we can have a chance to really look at them so we know what they mean. I didn't mean uh, to put, make I, that in lieu of sending it a Yeah, no, no, way. but I, I think rather than continuing this discussion, Luis had a and final word. Yeah, you're kind of along the same lines. The different iterations of the options we'll get, or have we? You have the different, iter you have each of the. Newer the, ones. Well, you have option one. There's no newer maps today. It's the same maps that we discussed last time. It's just right. more clarification on them. We also have put them up on Google Maps, and I believe I sent a link. Maybe that's been sent around so that you can look at the maps in further detail, and then we'll be able to be yeah. on a call for next Hey, Paul, week. can you um, send me that again, the link? And I'll yes. forward it to the board, because um, that might have got lost. In, sure. You know, it, was a while back, it was a while back, and um, I, I, it'd be better if I can send them a more recent update. Absolutely. Good. We'll send it to you. So next time we, we look at this, it's going to be at our study session, and we'll, we'll uh, try to approach decision. Now, now what, what is our decision-making model? I mean, we, our, th this is not going to be submitted to voters for approval. This is something we decide. Is that correct? It is something that we're going to have you decide, but then also the Board of Governors is going to provide a waiver to allow you to change election systems. Okay. Right. Right. Uh, so that is a process that was approved by Marty Block's bill being passed. It's been signed by the governor. The Board of Governors is going to start approving these right. uh, new models, mm -hmm. uh, I believe, in January. Yeah, and I, yeah, and I received um, the boilerplate for that to take place, which came from the Chancellor's office. Okay. And so I have it in my office, but there's no point at this point until we make a decision. Following up on uh, Trustee Viegas's question, my understanding was that we would be reviewing, discussing the options on November 3rd, then the board meets again November 10th. And at that point, we, the plan was to put it on the agenda you know, for vote. Uh, but let's say they don't do that on November 10th, then the board doesn't meet again to December 15th. So really getting to uh, Trustee Viegas's question in a little bit more detail, um, what is the last date that, you know, would December 15th be too late? Should we aim for November 10th board meeting? What, in terms of your timeline to get everything approved, uh, do we need to meet? I think that um, your county registrar is going to want to have this stuff in place sooner rather than later. Uh, most of the county registrars have been telling people they want it by November, which isn't happening um, in most places. But they're, they'll be flexible until it gets to be about January or February when they're going to start getting very anxious about being able to get the lines in place for the elections. Now what's going to happen is the county not only needs to know what your lines are for where you're running, but if we put a line down a street where they don't have a separate precinct line yet, they're going to have to reshape their precincts to adjust to your boundaries. So that, that's some technical work on their, half, so on their behalf. So the earlier the better is, is what I would suggest. If we were able to do it in November, that'd be great. But if it's December, we'll still have the time, I think, okay. time to get it done. Thank you, Paul. Are you, I'm sorry, Paul. Are you suggesting that the county will reshape its precincts because <coughs> of SBCC's election as opposed to anyone else's? No. What will happen is this is the burden of the registrar. Um, and it's a greater burden as more people go to districts is that when somebody walks into a polling place, they need to know that everybody that walks in that polling place is voting for the same city council, school board, legislature, right. no, whatever. That makes sense. So when a boundary goes and splits down in an area that used to be unified, they now have to reshape their precincts. Sometimes they'll split a precinct, and you walk into a polling place, and it'll say precinct 255A on that side of the room, precinct 255B on that side. And that's because somebody's district has oh, I see. split that precinct. So it wouldn't influence our districts. It just means that it's more work on their part to accommodate it in terms the of... The registrar has got it. Which, which does raise the question of cost. Is there a way of guesstimating 
a, a, a differential of the cost between what we're doing now and what, and, and ultimately, I guess, who pays? The registrar would be paying for re rebuilding their shape files and for the administering of that election. I don't believe that there would be a different cost for you uh, based on transitioning districts, but that's something that could be checked out. Sure. Okay. Good. Thank you so much. Thank you Paul. very much. Could you Appreciate check that out? Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thank, thank, thank you, Paul. Credit coming to it. Yeah, I think Thanks, everybody, for coming. It's very helpful. I think we need to ask the county registrar what, what they need and, and in terms of dates and filing and so forth. Yeah, I just didn't want to suggest it. Yeah, we'll, we'll ask them in terms of dates. Okay. Fine. The uh, item 1.4 is our next item, hearing of citizens. Uh, do I have any? Uh, we have no slips for hearing of citizens. All right. So we move on to item 1.5, which is the approval of the minutes of the regular meeting for September 22nd, 2011. Is there a motion to approve? Okay. Well, Lisa, all of them, move? or there are three? Uh, there are three. Are you comfortable approving all of them? Um, I have a, a threshold question. Yes. Um, I believe in May and um, the May minutes, did we not have long form minutes then? So is this, are these the minutes that were drafted in May or? I don't know. Um, well, Angie, can you answer that? The May, the May minutes, the May 25th and the May 23rd. In September, we obviously didn't have the long form, but did we have, a, have them in May 23rd and 25th? Yeah, this is not the... Uh, this is closed session. But we had, did we have verbatim comments? We didn't. Okay. Well, the, the 23rd, did we have verbatim comments in any minute? Okay. So is there a motion to approve all of the minutes? Uh, Peter? Yes. Uh, two things about that. One, I was not there for yes. one set, okay. so I think it needs to be separate. And the second is that I have a minor typo correction in Good. one of the others. Okay. So we return to my first query, which is, is there a motion to approve the minutes of September 22nd? Lisa moved. I'll second. Marty, second? Mm -hmm. Is there discussion of those minutes? I think it's the 23rd. Did you say the 22nd? It says 22nd. September. 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 September 22nd. Okay. No discussion. Therefore, may I assume that those minutes are approved. Uh, regular meeting of May 23rd. Is there well, a motion? That's the, the first one was the one I can't vote on because I wasn't there. September 22nd. September okay. 22nd. So we, have to, we need to take a vote. Yeah. 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 Okay. We're back to September 22nd. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Abstentions? I abstain. One abstention. We move to the minutes of May 23rd. Is there a motion to approve? Motion. Motion is made to approve. Is there second. a second? Second. Is there a discussion or corrections? Hearing none, we'll move to a vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Abstentions? Same. Abstain? One abstention. A regular meeting of May 25th, the continuation. Is there a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Motion to approve, and Joan? Shouldn't there be a, an attendance ro roll call on that meeting that is included? I, I think we were all there, but should that also be included in that one on the continued meeting? since? There was a period of time difference. On May 26th, there is. 25th. 25th. Okay. 25th. Okay, well, let's, let's add that. Okay, let's. We were looking for a second. Uh, second is corrected. Okay. And, and I have another minor correction. Good. Um, and that is in 1.6, the second sentence. Um, I believe it says they conducted an evaluation, not a self-evaluation. I'm sorry, tell me again where it is. Item 1.6, uh, second sentence. On the 25th. They okay. conducted an evaluation. You're right. Thank you. 
Okay, is that acceptable? So All right. move as corrected. It, Can I second? It, it has been moved and seconded and corrected. And amended. And both. amended. And all in favor of this final version, say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. I'm abstaining over there. One abstentions? Good. Abstention, yes. Okay. We move on to uh, communications 1.6. First is a report by our president of our academic senate, Dean Nevins. Uh, president Hasland, members of the Board of Trustees, Acting Superintendent, President Friedlander. Um, the Senate continues to work on a variety of issues that impact the college and the faculty. Uh, the first item is uh, we're discussing the impact of the 21 TLU cap. Uh, as you may know, there's a board policy that says that a, a regular load for faculty members is 15 TLUs, and you can go up to 21 <coughs> TLUs with approval. Um, there was a m movement by the Senate to reduce the number of faculty who were over 21 TLUs. Approximately 25% of our full-time faculty teach over 21 TLUs. And the Senate um, last year felt that that was an excessive number. And so we had asked uh, the EVP to enforce that board policy a little more stringently. And uh, so they did, which was excellent. Uh, then what happened was is it had some, of course, unintended consequences, <laughs> as these things sell, always, oftentimes do. And so we are reconsidering um, that cap and, and, that, and the language in that policy. <clears throat> so we're talking about that right now. Um, we're also concerned with the uh, response to student, student Success Task Force recommendations that came out. Uh, they came out from the Student Success Task Force, and they're wide-ranging. There's a lot of them, and the response time is very, very short. Uh, November 9th, I believe, is the first cutoff. There's some noise about maybe they'll have some additional meetings to get more input, but as of right now, November 9th is the cutoff. Um, there's probably not going to be enough time in the Senate to come up with a unified response, so what we're doing is we're talking about it encouraging senators to go and give individual feedback. Yeah, just for clarification, uh, that's the uh, statewide Student Success Task Force, not a local task force. Yeah, headed by our, our own Dr. McDougall. So, yeah, so we're talking about that. Obviously, has very large implications for the community college system. So we're discussing that. And then yesterday, we uh, finished the first part of our process. <laughs> if you know, you remember, we've been working on this process to reallocate TLUs. And we're talking about the bottom-up approach and also informing the conversation between the deans, the uh, EVP, and the acting superintendent president. Uh, that was completed yesterday, as far as the process goes. And then now what's going to happen is we're going to give to the department chairs a worksheet for them to fill out to do their, to do their cuts. And if you remember, the overall process is we're asking the department chairs to uh, do two scenarios where they're cutting 8% of their TLUs and about 12% of their TLUs. The 8% reflects the college's target and the 12% is kind of a little more. And the idea behind this is we want departments, first off, to make the, the cuts real to everybody because that precipitates a conversation among all the faculty in the department about what's going to happen. So it makes it very real to everybody. Also what it does is it provides building blocks for um, the deans and EVP and the superintendent president to actually make these cuts in a way that the faculty think will work uh, for the students. So that's the first part of it. The second part is a set of recommendations for uh, the folks having the conversation, the kinds of things that the faculty would like to emphasize. So those are the two parts of this thing. So the first part of the departments doing their preliminary cuts, and by the way, the cuts are just proposed cuts. Uh, they're not obviously going to happen necessarily. That's going to be decided by the administration. But it does give them something to, to work with. Um, so we're going to do that part first. And then um, when that concludes, I'm going to work with uh, Dr. Leonard to figure out maybe some way of presenting the whole process to you guys so you guys can see this thing from beginning to end. There's a lot to it. And it's involved in an awful lot of communication with a lot of faculty members. Literally, literally hundreds of faculty have participated in this. So it's been a very big deal. And uh, now we push it out to department chairs uh, and get the response back, it's going to be very interesting to see how that works for us. And uh, it was nice because the Senate concluded actually two weeks early, which was really nice because we wanted to give the department chairs the maximum amount of time to work on this. So are there any questions? Yeah, Joan. Um, I'm, again, reading, reading these minutes because it is fascinating what you're engaged in right now. The, the confusion I had on the minutes of um, October 26 was the number of replacement positions. Oh, yeah. That, there were, I mean, right. it was all over the place. Mm -hmm. So are we settled on what your task is on that? Do we have confirmation yes. that it's appropriate number to be working with? 
This is actually, that's a very fascinating discussion actually, it really is, because what happened was we started out being targeting 18 reductions, and it was going to be six this year and 12 next year. Well, it, it turned to 10, and I was very surprised at that, because it was, that's quite a significant drop. And it turns and that out- was, And it turned to 10 by what process? How did it go from- um, I was in CPC and I saw 10 on the screen, and I was like, what? <laughs> that was the process. Um, in fairness though, what happened was there was a law change which says that after a certain reduction, if you drop below your frozen level of faculty obligation, it becomes a penalty. And that was new. So that was something that was new information for us. Also, the um, 18 that was initially uh, put in there was based on a higher uh, state reduction of funding than actually materialized in the state budget. So at the time, we put the worst case scenario, which didn't occur in our budget assumptions, which was called for 18. Then when they settled on a state budget, taking into account the trigger, which we think will be pulled, uh, it dropped to 10 um, that we wouldn't replace. And that's over the two-year period? Okay, mm -hmm. so 10 over a two-year period. But the much larger driver was that full-time faculty obligation. That was by far a larger driver, even in the budget. And that is yeah. new, because, I mean, they it, gave us a waiver on that, and now it's back on and, again. And, and they might give us a waiver again, but we don't know that. So just this last week, we got the communication from the chancellor's office saying, here is your full-time faculty obligation. And so that's new information to us, and new information to well, us, is, this includes the Senate. Um, and so I passed it on to Dean, and he took it, they took it, that into account. Dean, I want to be sure that everybody understands what, mm -hmm. what a full-time faculty obligation is. Could you help sure. us? Uh, the full-time faculty obligation is essentially, a few years ago, the number of full-time faculty teaching a percentage of their courses was frozen. And then that number, if we get additional money, we have a commitment to hire a certain number of faculty members to, to keep that proportion. Full-time faculty. Full-time, yeah. But that gets waived in term, when, when the uh, budget cycle is, I guess it's called inadequately funded, then they waive that obligation for us to do so. And also, as our, the number of 50 ES shrinks, our, our full-time faculty obligation goes down because it's proportionate to how many, how many classes are being taught. So what's happening to us is we're losing classes, so our number's actually going down, and the state projects that number forward every year. And they, they take a guess as to where we're going to be, and the 2011 number just came out, as Jack, as Jack mentioned. And so our full-time faculty obligation has actually been going down, but if we cut faculty, if we don't replace faculty, um, we will be right near that number. That's, that's the thing, because if the number's dropping slowly, but then also we're going to cut, and there's a, we're going to be just a little bit above that when we get through the 10 faculty members. That's why we couldn't go to 18, because we'd actually be below that ratio. As far as the cost savings that we're, we're hoping to reach, it's a, now you know, that our hands are tied again by the state, right. where, where well, are well, we? What was in the budget was 10, so we'll reach the 10. What we asked the Senate to take a look at prior to getting the uh, full-time faculty obligation but which number, and we're still asking them, is can, given the magnitude of budget reductions that we have to make in the next two years, um, could we go higher than 10? which would take pressure off the other parts of the budget to save programs that um, would otherwise have to be, uh, you know, curtailed to one degree or another. And so that was a discussion that we were having with the Senate, and then we got these numbers. Now, everybody's predicting that the Board of Governors will waive the requirement, but they haven't done that yet. Uh, but right now, we're going on best information. And 10 is it, okay. And 10, so 10 was what we established in our, in our budget. Okay. Thank you. It's, it's actually not okay, but we have to do it because of the budget. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so what we're going to do is uh, we're just splitting up into two years, uh, six and four. Six was the long term. I mean, people have been thinking about six for quite a while. So we're probably going to go with that. However, we're going to have a conversation. The first year. The first year, for this year. Uh, we're going to have a conversation at the Senate mm -hmm. when we decide on the number of replacement positions to fill. Uh, whether we should stay at six or go higher than that. So we're actually going to have that conversation. We wouldn't go above 10, though, because of this penalty. Okay. Marsha? Um, going back to the uh, task force on student success, mm -hmm. you said that you don't think you'll have enough time to form a uh, academic Senate <coughs> response or comments. Um, have you considered just sending in the comment that we'd like more time? Mm -hmm. um, 
We could do that. I mean, I think as far as the whole state goes, I mean, people, everyone's saying this is really, really short. But on the other hand, there is a legal requirement for them to respond quickly because this, these student task force recommendations are supposed to generate legislation. And so they have to fit the legislative calendar. And that's the hard deadline that they have. And that's why they're going so fast. Mm -hmm. uh, there may be another meeting or two where they'll accept more input, but they're not going to put it off until, you know, March or anything like that. Yeah, it'd be interesting. Uh, today, as this afternoon, they had a, uh, the Southern California open you know, forum where people could comment to the task force members and Cheshire's office staff on input. I'll be talking to Peter McDougall. You know, he's at that meeting today, tomorrow, about what, what, the, um, what kinds of comments were made. And I suspect everybody's going to be asking for more time. But as Dean said, the Board of Governors has to uh, begin discussing the proposal at his January meeting and has to, um, by legislative mandate, finish their discussion and send something to the legislature in April. So they need the time to get it on their agendas and discuss it. So we're on a very, very tight time track. And I've read that report for the second time, um, and each time I keep on catching more things that raise questions. What's also happening now is each of the consultation, each of the uh, constituency groups um, have recently met or meeting this week or next week. For example, the um, chief instructional officers are meeting this week. The chief business officers just completed their meeting and, go, and so forth and so forth. So they're all providing input into the chancellor's office staff uh, uh, regarding the student success task force recommendations. So all that intelligence is being collected. What's, what I don't know, and that's what I'm going to try to find out is when we all go to, most of us go to uh, CLCC at the state level, I'm sure this will be a major topic of conversation. And the request is can we, what input they get from trustees and all the people who are at those groups at that meeting, including all the statewide group meetings take place on that Thursday afternoon or morning. The, it, for that November 17th not to be too late mm -hmm. for input, and I think that's what I was going to ask Peter tomorrow because I don't want. I think that's an important meeting to get input into this long list of very challenging um, recommendations. Some of which will have a huge effect on us, which I'll talk about in my remarks. Potential impact. And the the state senate actually wants to take a position where they would like the board of governors to detail how they handled the input they've gotten and how they've responded to it. So we're hoping to get that pushed in front of them. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Okay, um, JJ had to go out to town, and I don't believe there's going to be a student senate report today. There is no st student senate report. Okay, a report from classified employees. Liz. Good afternoon, Dr. Haslam, members of the board, uh, Dr. Freelander. Our consultation group met last week, and the members of CPC that are on the consultation group uh, discussed uh, the budget cuts. There's nothing concrete yet, so we really can't get into details, just kind of overwhelmed by the amount that has to be cut out of operations. In November, we're going to be looking at uh, the new proposed uh, email system, Gmail, to see how it will impact uh, the way we do our jobs and see if it can be adapted so that we can still do what we need to do. Uh, so that's under consultation. Uh, CSEA, we're bringing to you today our initial proposal for our contract renewal. It's on the agenda, so we're just doing what we need to do to get that ball rolling. Um, also, you'll notice on the agenda that we've uh, trying to, in order to keep people employed. Uh, you'll notice there's an involuntary transfer. So we're trying to work with the district, and the district works with us and the departments to try to, for areas where grant funding may be going away, trying to find positions for that, and we were able to do it in this case. So we'll be continuing to do that. I think that's one of the things you had in your uh, budget proposals that we try to re reassign staff that may be losing their jobs in other areas. So we are trying to do that. Any questions? Great. Thank you very much, Liz. Uh, we move on to 
Jack Friedlander. Good. I just received correspondence today, which I wrote you an email, but now I got an official letter after I wrote the email from that the accreditation visit will take place Wednesday, November 9th, and Thursday, November 10th. And John Nixon, who chaired our last site visit, will be chairing this one. And he'll be bringing two other team members with him to conduct the interviews. Uh, and he and I are speaking Monday, late Monday morning, about the logistics uh, you know, for that meeting. He just needed some more time to prepare um, in terms of who they want to interview for that. So I'll pass that on to you as soon as I finish that conversation with him. Uh, you'll have it either Monday night or early, early Tuesday morning. Uh, I'll give you those specifics. And the two people coming along with uh, Dr. Nixon, who has since retired from his um, superintendent president position at Mount San Antonio College. So he's retired right now, but he's still, actually he got hired by the Accreditation Commission this year to be, um, to help work with them. But it's Dr. Armin Hakopian, and he's the president of the Board of Trustees for Glendale Community College. And Mr. Brian Thebaugh, who is a professor of English and business, English business and institutional research at Palo Verde College in Blythe, California. So those are the three individuals who will be conducting the site visit, um, with John Nixon being the most familiar with the college uh, since he's been here and, you know, at her last visit. So that's where that is, and I included the correspondence in your, in your packet, but that's basically what it says to do that. The um, Student Success Task Force recommendations, which report which I sent you, which we talked about, contains Two contains many recommendations, two of which could have an enormous effect on this college, and they pertain to our continuing education program. And one is at the end of chapter four of that report, and it's on page 37 of the report I sent, you know, I, we gave you last time. And it basically says um, that amend statute to limit the scope of allowable non-credit classes to only those identified as career development or college preparation, which means that corresponds to the enhanced funded, which means that all the other classes that we offer in a state funded right now in continuing education, if this were to be supported and legislation carried next year, would no longer be funded. Uh, Peter and I had an email, I had a voice message exchange where I asked him, Peter McDougall, uh, that is, based on his knowledge, what does he think the, the chances are of that, rec those, that recommendation, and one other I'll read to you in a second, would go forward to the Board of Governors as a recommendation, and if it did, what is his sense of whether the Board of Governors would um, be supportive or not? And so that's what he and I are gonna talk about tomorrow, if we, and I'll let you know, uh, in an email, you know, what the outcome of that conversation is. And if, I, and if it's not tomorrow, he and I will talk on the weekend. We, um, we just tried to arrange a time when either both of us are available. And, um, but I'll have his general sense of, you know, where that is. The second one is, real quickly, and I gave it to you as an attachment just now, you know, in your packet, but to explain to everybody, what happened last year was, in California, the K through 12 districts, for the most part, have responsibility for adult education. Uh, some community colleges, like Santa Barbara City College, has that responsibility for their community. The state gave, as, as funded adult education in K through 12, through what they call categorical funding, you know, block grants, and because of the budget cuts that they had to make, the state said, we're giving you flexibility on how you spend your categorical dollars to use as you see fit, given the, you know, the budget cuts that you're um, facing. Well, it turns out that more than half of the money that was allocated for BLAS categorical funding for K-12 adult education got reassigned by the school districts to meet other needs. And so that drove a recommendation which basically says that 
um, state leaders need to determine if the current flexibility over K-12 adult education funds is consistent with state and economic social needs and whether these funds should be reallocated to serving basic skills needs. This is what's pertinent to us. They should also determine whether these programs will be best be placed in K-12 or community college systems, providing funding commensurate with the task. So what that recommendation is saying is that if all what the state will fund is what we're calling enhanced uh, non-credit, it's saying then it should either all be in K-12 or all be in community colleges so you have better coordination of the pre-college level uh, basic skills uh, and career preparation training as opposed to having it um, so, you know, not as centralized and focused. So that's basically what that recommendation calls for. Obviously, that would have tremendous implications for the college. And one scenario would be that a Board of Governors would forward these, those recommendations to the um, legislature. Some legislator or tours would carry that legislation next year that would go in effect the following year or whatever. So that's basically what I'm trying to get a read on in terms of our planning. It doesn't affect anything for this year or next year, but it's something we do have to keep, keep into account as we plan going forward. So that's basically, um, I had a, a number of other items that- Jack, um, Jack on yeah, that particular yeah, issue. Yes, um, yes. What is, what is the differential now between what K-12 gets for FTES and what we get? I, I can research that and find out for you. It's a good top, question. Top of, your head. I mean, well, I never knew like that number. Three thousand dollar difference. Well, I know I know what it is for us here, uh, you know, if, uh, but I don't know what, what K through twelve gets. And I'm so rather than speculate, Alphalia, do you know? Well, it makes two. It makes all of us. I, I don't know either. I'll find that. You know, it's a good question actually, because uh, especially in light of this recommendation. Because it was something that we raised, Peter. You were at the um, Trustee Haslin. You were at the meeting when we talked to the current. Secretary of Education, right. we did raise the issue, is it cheaper for us to do it at our differential than K-12 to do it? Because there is a significant amount of money, and yeah. it could be maybe well, why somebody's think, playing football with that issue. Yeah, what's interesting, I think the way I'm understanding it now in K-12, they get categorical funds, and they distribute it. Uh, but I need to find out if, but the categorical funding would be based on headcount, just like our categorical funds are based on how many students are being served in a program with, with caps that the state puts on based on budget. But let me try to find that. I can make a, neat, a, a quick phone call and find out. You know, that was one of the issues when we were dividing up non-credit is that K-12 was getting reimbursed at higher rates right. than mm -hmm. community colleges were. <clears throat> I think you're so right. Turf wars were starting over that, so just to be alert. Well, I think it's important skills. even to have that information for um, the Board of Governors and um, um, as they consider this okay. recommendation. So I'll follow up. It's a very, you know, stump me on that one. I don't know the answer. I Never I, did. I thought I remembered. I had them all memorized at one time between UC, CSU. Uh, so we're always on the bottom. Right. Yes. UC is probably on the top. Yeah. But K-12, I think, was second. Oh, no, no, no. We're, we're always on the bottom. You know, yeah. we're the low no, cost. No, but K-12, I think, was maybe below UC, or was it third? Was it below CSU? Yeah, I almost think third. it was. That UC, translates. Just like maybe 9,000 a student and. It yeah. translates to making us the best educational deal we are. on the planet. That's why all of a sudden elsewhere. the governors in states and yeah. Congress, everybody all of a sudden loves community colleges. Uh, That's right. They so, don't love us. But I can see the money follow enough. the, uh, the uh, aff affection. Because what's happening, ironically, is everybody's talking about the importance of community college and how important they are. Um, federal and state funding has gone down. So the rhetoric for us has gone up. At the same time, the funding has gone down. Yeah. So, um, so is, uh, is there any political meaning, Jack, in the fact that uh, the print on this page is almost evaporated? I, yeah. mean, it's, I remember reading about invisible ink years ago. Yes. But I was taking a dim view of it at the minute, at the time. So, um, dim view. Yes, sorry about that. But um, is, is it was. Um, um, to that? But yeah, uh, when we just made the copies now, because it's made from a copy of a copy of a copy. Um, okay, okay. I think what the, the really interesting part here is that K through 12 
apparently had the flexibility in terms of how it would apply the funds, Correct. Uh, whereas we never had that flexibility. Well, that's not true. Um, it's true, it's not true. It's in that we had the flexibility of saying, here's how much of our funding we're going to appropriate for non-credit, and here's how much for credit. So we had the flexibility that way. We had no flexibility in um, saying how much the state's going to pay us and reimburse us. And so Joan's question was really, you know, how is their funding rate established and what is it? And I, that, that's what I need to research. Okay. In the interest of time, I had a number of items that I wanted to call to your attention, a lot of accomplishments and significant events, but I'll just email that to all the board members rather than my reading it to you now. And any other comments I was going to make, I'll just include that so um, we can get done in a decent hour. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, report from board members. Joan? I've got several, so Marty, if you want to go ahead. I have several, okay. Um, at the study session, I, we were looking at the college plan and I saw two things that had been left off from the previous college plan. And one was had to do with a goal for recycling or goal for diversion. And the other one was using uh, best sustainable practices when it comes to maintenance or, or building. Um, I since have done some research and looked into it, and I, I've been surprised that the college um, SBCC's uh, diversion rate, if you don't look at, at the huge amounts of concrete that are taken out with, with uh, building things, you know, with our construction, but if you just look at the diversion, meaning that things are being recycled instead of di and diverted from the landfill, it's at 34% whereas the city itself is at 70%. And to me, that's an astounding difference. Um, it just shows me that, that there no, hasn't been a huge effort here to, um, to divert. And, and probably most of our garbage here is paper, when you look at it. So, yeah. you know, we well, should be able to divert more. But my whole point is just that right. I would hope that the, this college plan, which left both of those out, would have something in it that would be a little bit broader and just say that, uh, uh, and I'm, I'll make it up on the spot here, to explore drafting a sustainability plan or a green plan, especially as long as it saves the college money. And I can show different areas that it would save the college money, but I don't want to be spending more money, obviously, in this thing. But I yeah. think we can save a lot of money if we did do yeah. more. And I think what I can do is um, distribute to you, I mean, you being the board, uh, what our efforts have been and success we have, cause, and we had that in writing and documented. And the rationale, but we'll revisit it. That's why we. I, we gave it to the board early enough now we can have this kind of input okay. into the college plan, was that we've embedded that into how we're doing business now, and therefore it was, in a college plan, we weren't listing every item that we're engaged in, those that where we felt that attention had to be done. And so what we achieved in this plan we just finished was developing a plan so that we have achieved that, now it's just implementing that plan. Oh, okay, I didn't see a, a, a green plan or a sustainability No, plan. so we'll forward what we have to you. Um, okay, and, thank you. And you, can say, and you can look at that and say, based on what I read, um, I think you know, here's some ideas and why, why you might want to you know, okay. consider putting that in as a goal. Okay. Um, and so that, that's what we'll get to you. I just remember Santa Barbara School District claimed that they had a lot of green, you know, they do a lot of recycling in right. the classrooms and so on. and. Um, we, we, we partnered up with them and we saved them over $80,000 a year because recycling doesn't cost, whereas the, you know, right. the, the landfill stuff does. So sure. it just seems to me there might be room to save some money. And I'm not sure. I know Joe Sullivan said we picked all the low-hanging fruit, but right. um, I guess I want to look at that and just make sure. Yeah, now we're picking up the scraps off the plates. We asked students and staff to go right. just to sort. But, um, but we'll, yeah, rather than take up time here, I think it's a yeah. reasonable um, suggestion, and we'll follow through on that. Thank you. Okay, Joan. Hey, and I'm just thinking, didn't we make a report when we had the joint meeting with the city? Because I remember the city put on an mm -hmm. extensive report, and I thought we had countted with what our we efforts were. Ours, yeah. And I thought, be, yeah, it might be in the minutes from that meeting. Yeah, Joe, didn't you give a presentation to the board 
not that long ago. Um, maybe um, it was longer than I think, but um, yeah. Okay, or just send it to me so I can see if you have an email. Or I mean, a PowerPoint or something. Thank you. Okay, two two things. One thing. Um, I don't know where we are on the CEO search process. I just wanted to get updated on what our calendar, we left it, that they were going to do some background check. So do we have a, a next date I, I spoke on that? with uh, Sue Ehrlich a little while ago, and the, the plan is to bring the recommendations, or not recommendations, but the, the, the checking that we asked her to do to the study session, okay. and then yes, we, we will. Okay. Yeah, yeah. because aren't we up against a time? Right. They were all wanting to get started yes. on that. Okay, so I just didn't know what happened to that one. And then I have a prepared for um, information item on the cost that the board has expended. And I, I'll use that, I shouldn't use the term board because that means it's a collective decision, but on the legal contract that the president of the Board of Trustees has entered into since April. This goes back to the board vote to hire outside counsel for the use of the board. Prior to that, we the board relied on the legal services of in-house counsel, um, Vice President Ehrlich, and we had never engaged a, an outside attorney exclusively for our use. We used outside counsel, but it was done as a board operation usually under the direction of the superintendent president, starting with the contract that was signed in, um, I believe it was March. We did engage the services of Craig Price, and then some time during the summer, the services of Mary Dowell were engaged under the authorization of board president Peter Haslam. So I have requested, I requested it in the March meeting that I would like to get a running account on that, I never got it. I requested again in July, I never got it. So I had to file a public records request to get this information, which I think is really unfortunate that a Board of Trustees member has to file a public records request to find out what the board is doing. Through that, I did find that the board president has authorized $85,259.28 worth of legal services split between Mary Dowell and Craig Price. The, I have the, the breakdown between the two attorneys, but the issue is that this has been authorized by the board president, none of which ever went through any sort of review process, nor was it necessary apparently under the contract. The reading of the contract that was signed gave the board president authorization to engage this single-handedly. So that's just simply my report. I wanted to find out how much were we spending as a board. We went from zero to $85,000. And this is just up through August 30th. I have another public information request for the period from September to the present. Um, this raises, obviously, a number of issues. We're running a very tight budget. We've never really talked about our board budget. We have expenses going to conferences, and we should know what that, those are. We maybe need to relook at what is our stipend that we get. We raised it a few years ago. Is it time to drop it down in interest of budget austerity? And then also our role, are we, is it appropriate for us as board members to be receiving the same health insurance allowance that full-time faculty are getting? So. As a board, we've never really looked or been responsible for a budget, nor do I even know where it exists in the college budget. I don't know where to go look for board expenses. I don't know where this $85,000, it might have gone under just simply college legal expenses. But I think because it's the action of a single individual on the board and not a board collective expense, we need to find a way of keeping track of this. $85,000 out of the budget for five months is a very, very large amount to be authorized by a single person. So I was curious when we, if you go back, and I included the minutes on the February 24th meeting of 2011, that's when we took a vote, when we had a discussion, it has a close to a verbatim discussion, and certainly some of the issues that we raised then 
what does this mean? Should we, how do we keep track of it? What is this going to look like? So this is kind of our mid-year report. This is what it looks like, $85,000 being allocated for outside legal counsel for, um, on the authorization of the board president. So I'm reporting that and we can take that information and do whatever else we want with it later. Um, Marty? Yeah, I just wanted to um, reiterate something that Joan just said, and that is when we look at a budget, we should look at the president's office budget if we come under that budget, and I think we probably do, um, like we're a department looking at that budget so that we can analyze how much for conferences and so on. I think that's a very reasonable thing to do, yeah. so thank you for bringing that up. And then secondly, I think $100 a meeting for a stipend, you can cut it in half if you want to, but that's, I mean, that's, that's almost pitiful, but it's okay. I mean, I don't plan on making money here, but you know, $100 a meeting is what we get. I just wanted to make it clear because it sounded like when you were saying it that we get some huge amount, well, and, I think, and that's all we get, I and I'm fine with that. Of the legal, the legal limits, which is $400. I think it's my turn right now. It's okay. $400, no, nope, not to exceed $200 a month for no, a regular let, meetings. Let, let Marty finish. And then the other thing is, you said you have been asking over and over for something, and, and I, th I don't think you should have to uh, put in a Freedom of Information Act request to get something. So that doesn't seem, I think you should be able to get the information. Um, and I know I asked over and over to find out how much the court reporter was costing us. I think you remember that in all the meetings. I kept asking and asking. Never got an answer. And finally, when I made my first ask of Jack, I have the answer right here. It cost us $11,800 for the court reporter. So that's, you know, it's good to have the answer, but Our within an hour or getting... two, I had it back, which is what we should do, and you should be having that too. So I'm just saying that. Um, so. Um, I think we're, we may be of an era of having uh, a little bit more re reaction to what we asked for, and I don't think you should have to put in any more Freedom of Information Act requests. Other comments? Okay. Um, I, received a, I received a communication mm -hmm. from a constituent concerned about the safety issue involving skateboarding on, on our footbridge. We have huge signs on this footbridge that say no skateboarding, no bicycling. Uh, and some years ago, I had a very personal encounter with somebody on a skateboard. He plowed right into me. I fell down. He fell down. He laughed. I didn't. He was not apologetic for what he had done. In fact, he was somewhat irritated that I had been in his way. Not everybody does that. Uh, most people would stop and say, gosh, I'm sorry. But the fact remains, we have, we have a problem. And the constituent was saying, we are liable. We, if, if somebody is rolling down the hill at 20 miles an hour and pops into somebody, it's likely that uh, at some future point, somebody's going to hit their head and be in serious trouble. Um, I understand the argument for doing nothing. The argument is we don't have police force. We don't have people who are authorized to confiscate skateboards. We, you know, there's some really good reasons why we haven't acted. But I think it's time that we have a very careful look at some options so that it's sort of like waiting for if the earthquake hits. It's not if it hits, it's when. Uh, I, I communicated my concern and my constituents' concern to uh, President Friedlander, and <coughs> he, he very kindly responded that we are going to take this seriously. But I think more than just padding on, on the on the footbridge or some, something that would make the skateboarder not terribly happy about it. I, I think I'd really like to engage the whole college community, including the students, because there is an issue here about a culture that says it's okay. We have these big signs, they are meaningless. Well, they're not meaningless. They're there for the purpose of, 
of helping people understand that there's a safety issue here. And it isn't that, that some people are just better at ducking than others. I mean, some of us have a little slower movement getting out of the way. Um, but w I think we, it's, it's our community college. It's our community. We need to help each other do this. That alone won't do it. I understand that. But I, I would like to see, I don't know, some action taken by, by the student senate or by the student body to help us affect this culture. It didn't happen overnight. It's not going to go away overnight. <coughs> um, I'm, I'm painfully aware of the difficulty of doing something, but I think talking about it may help and seeing if there isn't some kind of action in the future that we can take together that would affect this, I think w would be a really good idea. Mark? I, I think that's a good point, Peter. And now that we've discussed it, I think there's a, an urgency here because we do have liability insurance. However, if we know something is inherently dangerous, they may not want to pay us for that unless we t take corrective action. And you're describing one incident with yourself. I'm, uh, I'm assuming they other incidents. And I think it behooves us to enforce that uh, rule. And there's probably a number of ways to do it, but I think we should not take it lightly. Good. Yeah, Marsha? I support both what you said and Maury said, and I would add that I think that there's a damage issue as well to the surface of the bridge, which um, ultimately led us to a situation where it had rotted away and we had to spend a great deal of money to rebuild it. So from that perspective as well, um, we should try to uh, work with this issue. Okay. Um, and I just want to say this is a topic that's come up any number of times on, and particularly in facilities because we always ask how can we build in ways of preventing this and that there was a period of time when we did add things, bumps on the, the edges of various things and certainly the bridge when we were looking at it that was a main concern. Could we put something in there that would stop us and what we ran up against is handicap mm -hmm. access. So it's something that is a concern. We've tried to put in physical barriers for it, so we've probably done as much as we can on that. So now it does become a matter of enforcement and personal choice on it. Yeah. Uh, but I, I would have to say I don't think it was skateboards that led to the problems on the bridge, but certainly there are other problems that skateboarding on the bridge, including being charged with being rude and intrusive when you make any comments. So I haven't been hit yet, but somebody probably wanted to hit me whenever I look at them and tell them, walk your bike or get off that skateboard. Well, so it isn't, it isn't a pleasant situation. Yeah, and no. it's the bridge, but it's also other parts of the campus. And it's been an enormous problem. And, and you're right, Dr. Uh, Jesse Livingston, that we've over the years have tried to figure out different strategies. The most recent one, and this is what I wrote back to um, Peter Hasland, was you know, we're installing you know, about 10 or so calming devices that make it more difficult for people to uh, skateboard fast and we put them in strategic places where we can on campus without adversely affecting uh, access issues. Uh, but what's going to take, and I, I appreciate um, Peter's suggestion, is a campus-wide effort because right now, I remember last year and year before, I would tell skateboarders to, you know, was, they couldn't be doing what they're doing. Um, some would get off, walk about, you know, go about six yards ahead of me, then get right back on it. And others just looked at me and didn't care and um, kept on going. But I think it's amazing how much pressure, peer pressure can have. I mean, look at smoking cessation. We're almost, and it's the same thing. People look at you know you're you're putting us in de in danger, which they are, and you're damaging our facilities, which they are. Uh, and if we have a collective effort, we can probably do the, more that way than through strict enforcement, which we don't have the capability of doing. So I think it's a very wise, smart approach. And you know I'll bring it forward to College Planning Council. We'll, we'll begin a discussion on that. Good. Thank you. We um, was there any other. Board member wishing to make a comment? All right, we move on to uh, item two, governing board. We've done item 2.1, we move to 2.2.
recommend approval of collective bargaining agreement between the Instructors Association and the district. Jack? Yeah, and this is, um, each of you is the result of a you know, lengthy negotiation with the IA, and this is what the Instructors Association and administration uh, tentatively you know, agreed to, and this is being presented to you today. We reviewed it in past you know, study sessions or closed sessions with the board um, as, as we were negotiating you know, the various items. And this is the culmination of, of that. So there shouldn't be any surprises in what we agreed to. What is unresolved is Article 12. Article 12 is what was in the contract, uh, previous contract, regarding giving, um, taking account seniority of adjunct instructors in course assignments. And that's turned out to be a very um, uh, controversial you know, provision. And so the Instructors Association is working with their constituencies to try to look, come up with a revised version of Article 12. And in this contract calls for reopener on that item, as well as um, if there's any change in salary and benefits in terms of a COLA next, next two years. So that Article 12 will come back when the faculty, you know, IA, working with his constituents to so the faculty um, come up with a, a revised proposal. And that's what, at that point, they can ask, or the district can ask for a reopener to get that in here. So that's sure to that. I'm not sure, Sue, if you want to say anything. You know, Sue Earl and Joe um, Sullivan and I were involved on the negotiating team. Bruce Barsic um, was our uh, negotiator on that. and. For the district side, the IA had their representatives there, so that's. And, and, and Lynn Stark yeah. is here. Do you? And Lynn was. A, you want to uh, have? Right. Right. Okay. And Cornelia was their, their, you know, their head negotiator, and she's here as well. And this was submitted to the faculty for approval. And uh, what was the what was the approval vote? Sixty-forty, yeah, for approval. I see. Okay, so and and that's the part that is going to come back to us. Yeah. Okay. But you're up to it. Good. Okay. Good. All right. So, uh, are there questions of? of Jack or anybody else from the dais. Yes. Um, I was curious, the, the agreement references a number of district policies which I was unable to find on the website. And, <laughs> and I was wondering when I was going to be able to. <laughs> Originally, they were up on the website prior to the accreditation visit. Um, what we're trying to do, rather than wait until each policy has an opportunity to be reviewed, is just get the existing policies up there. Mm -hmm. okay. It's easier said than done, but we're working. Okay. If you have any specific questions, please ask. Well, I'm I'm interested in maybe mainly in being able to find them and then correlate with the agreement. So if we're going to get them up there, that would be great. Um, I know it came up in our December orientation meeting, and it would be great to um, see some of those going up. Um, okay. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. It's moved. Is there a second? Maury Jerkowitz seconds. Further discussion? Yes, um, I'm just going to announce that I am going to vote against this. And 19 years I've voted against this. It's never come to this close of a passage, so I'm not going to change now. My primary feeling is there's one criteria when we hire people, and that's student success. That's the one criteria, and that should be the only criteria when we make these choices. So 
because that always was our motivating principle, we never felt that granting rehire rights to become superior to the needs of students' success. It was never comfortable. I think we have a good track record of valuing the person that we hire is the best person for the job. So I've always been against extending rights out to people just across the board um, that might not work. I don't care how you write this up, it still is giving rights to first of all, non-employees, a, a part-time person is no longer an employee of the district, and we're extending rights to a group of people that are not, are not even employees anymore, which just leaves us in this shadowy area of potential exposure to any sort of litigation, follow-up, follow-through. I think it puts a tremendous burden on down at the dean level, the department chair level, to be weighing and balancing with such scrutiny to have to take that burden on rather than being dedicated as they always have been on the best person is the one that's going to be the best person for student success only. So with that in mind, and certainly you, you've got 19 years of me never approving of this, so this shouldn't come as any surprise. I will be voting no on this. And you're referencing Article 12 in, in particular, right? Sorry? You're referencing art, Article 12. Art, sorry, right. Article 12. Sure. So uh, to, to put it in as vague of term, well, we'll talk about it later. I am reminded of, of when President Haslam told us in February, I can assure that this board of, president of the board of trustees is not going to do anything on his own as far as engaging counsel $85,000 later. Obviously, our president did engage counsel. So what we put in writing is what counts, not what we say we're going to do in the future. So I'd be very happy to take another look at, at Article 12 when it comes back, but at this point I'm not going to accept it. Marcia? Um, I was going to suggest that perhaps at some uh, suitable time uh, in the next few months, and I recognize the, the duration of this agreement, but at some suitable time the board might have the opportunity to discuss um, its priorities in thinking about the future agreements that we negotiate with our various unions. And that's not something I've been through from the front end, and I think it would be useful for us. I assume that Joan is getting to the question of the evaluation type issues. You know, how do you decide that someone is the best teacher and, and how well they're doing at student success and, and some of those interesting issues. And I'm, there are many issues that we might be interested in discussing in the context of union negotiations. Yeah, well, normally, what you'll find next round is what we do, you know, management, we bring to the board early on mm -hmm. um, what our positions are, and we ask the board for input, and then we come back during the process at times so the board is engaged from the very beginning. What is our opening position mm -hmm. up to any changes we're making or new, new requests from the CSEA, the IA? Um, and so you'll find next, when you're involved in full iteration, that you'll be, okay. the board is consulted. Well, I appreciate and, that. and we actually get our direction from the board. Yeah. Uh, That, that's true. Correct. And that is in the contract, as, as you point out. Um, I'm just suggesting at a conceptual level, we might have a useful discussion. Um, and yeah. um, uh, Cornelia I, was waving her hand. I'd, I'd like to just reinforce what Marsha was saying, because I think there are a number of issues at a policy level, because some of this is policy, where we have chosen our core principles, our core values. And that is where this type of discussion, and including a number of other issues when it comes to what drives us in allocation of resources, which then does go down to contract negotiations. So I think I would like to Thank reinforce you. that discussion. Cornelia, speak quickly, because we're. Very quickly, 
quickly, thank you so much, uh, uh, President Haslund, for recognizing me. I just wanted to make sure that to clear up a confusion here, class assignments are made starting in the very beginning of, for example, fall semester for the next spring. They're usually like 90% finalized during the semester. And yes, Trustee Levinson, during that time, adjunct faculty are employees of this college. Thank you so much. We move to a vote. All in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Nay. Abstentions? Abstain. One abstention. Okay, we move to item 2.3, presentation of CSEA's initial contract proposal. <coughs> Jack, do you want to say anything about this? Do you want to address Liz? Yeah, in my discussion with Liz, oh, go ahead, Liz. Uh, was it? Right. Yes, there's really no presentation today, just introducing it. Okay, so there, there needs to be a motion to approve? Yes. Okay, I hear no motion, therefore it's <laughs> defeated. Start over. Okay, uh, shall we? Uh, no, we. No, I'll make a motion. A motion to receive. I'll, Isn't the motion action only receive. for notice? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You're, not, you're not voting to approve it. Yeah. Just to receive. You right. accept it. You accept it. You're accepting that you receive their proposal. You're acknowledging receipt. This is, this is a safe Lisa motion. makes the motion. Okay. Marty seconds. No. Uh, 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 that's Maury. Maury, sorry. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Abstentions? Thank you. There are none. Okay, unanimous. We move to point, uh, 2.4. Mr. President, I just to inform that we're going to move to pull the second of those policies in mm -hmm. 1547. Okay. We're bringing that to you Pull 5047. So we're asked to approve the uh, board policy 4600. Correct. And this policy we discussed at a study session and we reviewed it. It's pretty straightforward, it's just cleaning up language and updating it to make it accurate as to how we are organized. Is there a motion to approve board policy 4600? Move approval. Joan moves second. Discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Motion, um, abstentions, sorry. Motion is carried unanimously. Item, uh, well we go to item three, human resources and legal affairs. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I have one slight addition on page five, classified change in assignment. The middle of the page, the start date will be Lauren Roberts. The start date will be November 1st. And with that, I submit the consent agenda for your approval. Move Is there a motion approval. to approve? Move approval. Joan moves. Is there a second? Second. Lisa seconds. Discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Abstentions? Thank you, Sue. Uh, we are on, I can't flip that fast. Okay, I'll fill you. No, it's um, Alice Sharper. Maryland's Prevent is at a conference, so Alice Sharper is filling in today. Welcome, Dean Sharper. Right. So if Maryland's the acting EVP, what, what, are I'm you? I'm acting, acting. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, you're the understudy. Yes. The understudy. Um, there are two uh, items in uh, four, uh, report four. Four point one is recommended approval of new course proposals and course modifications, new programs and program modifications. And you can see in your attachment there are program modifications for four programs: administration of justice, law enforcement emphasis, um, administration of justice, criminology emphasis, administration of justice, legal studies emphasis. The are, there are three certificate of achievements that underwent some program modifications. Um, our associate in arts and animation and gaming, one other program, went through modifications through our curriculum committee, CAC. So we're recommending approval of these course mods through CAC. Is there a motion to approve? Move approval. Joan is moving. Is there a seconder? Second. 
and Marcia seconds. Discussion? Hearing none, we move to a vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, nay? Abstentions? Motion carried. 4.2. 4.2 is recommend approval of the um, degree verification agreement for educational institutions between SBCC and the National Student Clearing House. And there's a two page uh, attachment for this item 4.2, which just goes over the terms of the agreement that SBCC is proffering. Jack would like to speak. We, to we have a we had an existing contract with the uh, National Student Clearinghouse. When the aspect um, committee asked us for more information about transfers, specifically, they wanted to know of the students who transferred to a four-year institution, how many completed their baccalaureate degree within three years, two years, and so forth. So that's not that's data we hadn't contracted with this clearinghouse to receive. And so we had to do a contract real fast to get Aspen their data, which we did. And actually, it was, it was very impressive. Uh, it's, so it's something that we'll include going forward to see how well our students are doing once they transfer. And that's why you, you, this, this contract's on the agenda. Is there a motion to approve? Marcia? Actually, I was going to ask a question. Well, let's, let's have a motion on the floor. Motion. Motion is made. Is there a second? Second. We have a second. Uh, Lisa seconds. And go ahead. Um, you reminded me, Jack, that I had heard that um, some schools, UCSB, for example, may provide feedback to us about how well our students do when they transfer compared to other institutions. And I was wondering if that is occurring or is there a way to encourage that? Yeah, they were providing us that they are usually under, with a long lag time, as were cer certain CSUs. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure for what reason, I just, I'm glad you asked me, because we don't, starting about two, three years ago, maybe when they started cutting their budgets, we stopped getting those reports. Mm -hmm. I used to get them, and now I don't get them anymore. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll follow up with that, because it's something that we, okay. it is valuable to have. Yeah. And CSUs were very sporadic. Some did, some didn't. <laughs> You think that the system office would give it to us, and so um, it should be what computers are for. <laughs> well, they're there. I mean, it's just a matter of you know somebody's got to just you know do the programming, but it was already done because we used to get the information. So that's a good follow-up because you know that along with the data where our students are doing, and actually broke it down by um, institutions they went to, and it gave us you know three-year, four-year, five-year, one-year, two-year, and it also gave us longitudinal data. And last year, we took this huge leap up. Um, it was actually, and I go, great timing. It just so happened that's what we're giving to the uh, Aspen mm -hmm. Committee. But I'll follow up on that. That's, um, so you'll get your policies posted on the web, and we'll get some information on how our students are doing. And you should be happy, right? Happy. Right. OK. <laughs> okay. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alice. Did we, did we take a vote? No. No. No, we didn't take a vote. OK. Um, we move to a vote on item 4.2. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. 4.1. 4.2. 4.2. We already voted on 4.1. Yeah. That yeah. was continuing education. It's not. Oh, we, am I no, no. reading my numbers wrong? Sorry. Yeah. That's yes. Why. <laughs> um, I stand we, corrected. We have, uh, I asked for the nays. I asked for the abstentions. I heard none. M motion is carried unanimously. Welcome, Dr. Ariano. Good evening, uh, Dr. Haslin, Board of Trustees, Dr. Freelander. I have um, for your approval, 5.1, recommend approval of new or modified community service courses. Is there a motion to approve item 5.1? So moved. Luis moves. Is there a second? Lisa second. Discussion? <clears throat> Hearing none, we move to a vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Abstentions? Oh, Dr. Friedlander, I was going to ask for some clarification from the board. Um, if you know, on the second page, we bring before you minor course modifications. And this means that uh, some of the directors in meeting with faculty either want to decrease hours or make some minor changes. So my question is, do I have to bring, each and every time we make minor changes, 
for your approval or once the course is approved, does it give me that flexibility to um, change hours, et cetera? I would think one answer would be that the term minor is a little flexible itself. I'm, I'm not sure how flexible it would be or need to be, Marsha? Yeah, I thought I remembered reading something that required us to approve it. Not that we're, I'm saying we want to, but that there was some uh, uh, statement that we needed to approve those changes. And uh, I guess, let me ask for clarification. So would this be a, a course modification, uh, but, but because these are fee-based courses, there's no state approval, so you know, we're not under any obligation because it's not state reimbursed. It would probably fall under the broader board duties, maybe, but I'm happy to have someone look at it and see. Yeah, okay. I, when Ophelia discussed it with me, I said, you know, given, it's a matter of judgment, and the ones that she called to my attention were ones that you know, didn't rise to the level where you bring it to a board you know, meeting for approval, and where it does, then we then we'd bring it. And it's always on a case-by-case -case basis is relative mm -hmm. uh, and a rationale for it. But a lot of it is just minor tweaking. It just doesn't seem that's something the board needs to, um, to deal with. Just as one individual, I'd be satisfied if the two of you had had a discussion about it and that was it. I, I, wouldn't, want to, I wouldn't need to see it. Could you, could you give us an example so we can get a picture of what no minor sure. means? Yeah, if go ahead. Yeah, if I can get Ken, because he's the one that's been working with these um, course outlines. An example would be a class called a Culinary Tour of the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. It originally was set at uh, a 30 hour uh, maximum. Should go to the mic. Yep. Mm -hmm. We then, uh, in consultation with the instructor, decided Let's give it a range from 15 to 30 hours so we can accommodate shortened quarters, the summer. So it, that's the kind of change we're talking about. Yeah. Maybe a couple words in the description to better clarify what they're looking for. And these courses are not state subsidized? No, they're not. They're all community ed. Yeah. Peter, <coughs> that, mean, that means they're not approved by the state that's correct. Chancellor's office. So right. it seems to me, in conjunction with the president's office, mm -hmm. if there's anything that's more than tweaking, he can let us know. Yes. Otherwise. Yeah, and that's the arrangement that Dr. Ayana and I discussed, and I felt I, I was very comfortable making that recommendation. Okay. Because yeah, I mean, you don't need that level of detail here, but at some point, it's a judgment call, and I'll err on the side of you know informing as opposed to not informing. So we're going to okay. pile more on you. I love it. Yeah, I've got a long list here. Um, no, no, no. Thank you. It. We'll move on to uh, I, item I just want to underscore that certainly when we're looking at state apportionment is when we have our highest degree of scrutiny, which oh, yeah. we have, right. have appreciated Joe. the efforts that you've done on that. Yes. I'm, I'm trying to move back to our agenda. Thank you. Joe? Yes, you did. Yeah. You did. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, quit while you had our... <laughs> We, we take, have, take that vote and run. <laughs> we have, we have uh, a, a fairly long closed session as well. That's why I'm trying to rush us a little bit. I'll be bit. very quick. <laughs> <laughs> Item 6.1 is the consent agenda. Um, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? I move to approve, but I did have a couple questions well, on move A to approve, and I. Excuse me, one mm -hmm. thing at a time. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Uh, second. Discussion. Okay. Pulling, pulling out A and I on um, the purchase order, which um, if you go down the middle of the page, when it comes to the commemorative or signage at the drama music, uh, do you know what that sign is? Is it because I know typically one has a commemorative plaque. So do you know if that's part of it or is it just simply signage? For direction. It's in the middle of the page, Joe. It's um, well, actually, I can I can tell we're buying. I mean, the signage. Yeah. Um, let me look at the amount. I can tell you what it is. It's thirty-seven thousand dollars. So. It's in the middle of the page. It's um. That's the signage for all of the rooms, like the room numbers, okay. the, you know, any signage. Um, the district is, is in our contract. We took we pulled responsibility for that out and brought it back to the district right. because we wanted to manage it. The, the reason yeah. I brought it up was if there's going to be a commemorative plaque, my suggestion was that we include the Board of Trustees that 
pass to help pass Measure V in any sort of commemorative plaque. It's I just not, wanted to. It's not a commemorative. I, I wanted plaque. to it's, raise that issue, and then A, I was just curious. There's a special continuing education trust fund for Doc, uh, David Yosem's classes, and I'm just curious what classes he teaches. And obviously, somebody cared to make sure that he was available. Here comes Andy. You should take his class. Everybody loves him. I need to give money to it. So, so Joan, did, uh, did, was your question satisfactorily answered? No. The first one was, yeah. yes, and the first second one. one. Second. Okay, uh, I'm just checking through the, uh, the winter schedule at the moment. Um, <laughs> Dr. Yosson has uh, three classes that are being sponsored by a, uh, an anonymous donor um, from in town. And the courses are... Uh, the first one is called, Are You Prepared for Retirement? Uh, the second one is called, Going It Alone, Assuming Financial Responsibility. And the third course is called, Manage Your Own Portfolio. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So he managed his own trust. Uh, yeah. Getting so a gift. Good pretty good. good. <laughs> so is there concern with the consent calendar? Those were my only concerns. Okay. Thank you. Any other concerns? We are ready for a vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Abstentions? The motion is passed unanimously. Under business action items, section 6.2, we can take the adoption of resolution number 15, authorizing the routine internal budget transfers, and the adoption of res resolution number 16, providing for 2011-12 budget revisions due to the receipt of unbudgeted revenue together. Is there a motion to approve item 6.2 A and B? So moved. Second. Maury and Marsha. Discussion on the motion? Hearing none, we move to a vote. Oops, we don't move to a vote, do we? We go to a roll call. I almost stole Angie's big moment away. Trustee Ammon? Aye. Trustee Bloom? Aye. Trustee Kleiner? Aye. Trustee Jerkowitz? Aye. Trustee Livingston? Aye. Trustee Aye. Trustee Diego? Aye. Aye. That's close. Um, item 6.2C is the adoption of resolution number 17, which is the delegation of governing board powers and duties. Is that also to the same claimant on 19? Was it not the same? No, I'm sorry. The, you were one before that. This is 6.2C, resolution number 17, the delegation of governing board powers and duties. Is there a motion to approve item 6.2C? So moved. Lisa had her hand up and seconded by Joan. Take it. Discussion? Hearing none, we move to a vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Whoops. I'm sorry. I know it's a resolution. Sorry. It's so easy to do. I'm sorry. Trustee Ammon? Aye. Trustee Bloom? Aye. Trustee Conjure? Aye. Trustee Kaplan? Aye. Trustee Jacobson? Aye. 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 And we can take 6.2 D and E together, the adoption of the resolution number 18, providing for the payment of an outdated warrant, and number 19 is providing for the payment of an outdated warrant to the same individual. Um, okay. Is there a motion to approve? So, so moved. Should we raise, I mean, this is, this is a good point. Cool. We'll raise hands instead of orally saying that's cool. it. Um, Lisa and... Who's going to do the second? I'll second. Okay, Joan seconds. Um, is there a discussion on any of the component parts? Hearing none, we move to a roll call vote. Trustee <laughs> Aye. Trustee Bloom? Aye. Trustee Conjure? Aye. Aye. Trustee Aye. Trustee Aye. Trustee Aye. Trustee Aye. 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 And then item 6.2F is the adoption of resolution number 20. Um, for authorized signature for the California Department of Education 2011-12 contracts. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Luis approves. Is there a second? second. And Marsha seconds. Okay. Uh, discussion? Hearing none, we move to a roll call vote. Trustee Ammon? Aye. Trustee Bloom? Aye. Trustee Croninger? Aye. Trustee 
Aye. 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 Thank That's you very much, Joe. We, uh, we will suspend the meeting for the purpose of going into closed session to discuss the items. Item uh, 9.1, conference with uh, labor negotiators, and 9.2, conference with legal counsel about anticipated litigation. Okay, Pat English will not be in attendance. The others will. And also, uh, 9.2b, a tort claim, as indicated in your agenda. We will come back and report out as soon as we're finished with the closed session. Before minutes. With special thanks to our technicians who are here Hang out there. taking video of all of this. <laughs> you guys deserve a medal. You really do. <laughs> uh, it's my intention to report out from closed session. With respect to item 9.1, we provided guidance for our labor negotiators. With respect to item 9.2, we um, provided guidance with uh, uh, with respect to litigation, and we passed a, a motion. This was with respect to litigation or anticipated or possible litigation uh, as a result of uh, the agreement with Dr. Serban. The motion reads as follows. This Board of Trustees has determined that the agreement we have with Dr. Serban requires that her current salary payment from us be offset by the amount she receives by way of salary payment from the position with, or her position with Coast Community College District for that portion of the contractual period between October 3rd, 2011 and June 30th, 2012. This motion was passed by the Board of Trustees with a unanimous vote. Finally, um, with respect to 9.2b, we took no action. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Motion is made to adjourn. Is there a second? second? Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Do, are you guys disappointed that we're not going to stay longer? Do you want to just hang out? No? Okay. We are adjourned.